All right, hey everyone, it's Patrick here. And I wanted to make this video after doing the last 30 days sober of THC. So I've done little tolerance breaks from cannabis in the past, but honestly, for the last, I mean, maybe four years, but really much more apparently the last like two or three years, weed has been a big problem for me. And I guess what I want to do in this video is explore a couple of questions. The first question is, why did I start using cannabis in the first place? The second question is, when did I get the feeling that I needed to stop? And why did I get the feeling that I needed to stop? The third question is, what was it like for me trying to stop using cannabis? And then the fourth and final question is, how did I actually feel when I stopped using cannabis? So really going way back to question number one, <clears throat> I can still remember the first time I ever used cannabis, at least in a way that it made me feel like it really helped me. There were definitely times when I was in college and you know somebody passed me a joint and I took a hit and maybe I got the munchies a little bit, but I didn't really feel much, at least compared to what I'm about to describe to you. So we have to go way back to, I think it was 2017, when I was doing a production of Gypsy at a theater on Long Island. And since the theater was on Long Island, that meant we all lived at our, you know, apartments in New York City and we would take public transit out there to Long Island to do the show and then the theater would put us on a van and transport us back into the city after the show and I found that after a while of this and it didn't go on for that long maybe the show ran for a month or something but after that kind of nightly thing of like waiting for everybody to be done with the show and then getting in the van and then sort of listening to all the conversation going on in the van, which, you know, varied on any given night. It was actually this time of year, uh, I guess that would have been like almost seven years ago now. I remember because um, I remember Halloween being like during that run of the show and there's, there's something connected to cannabis there too. But my point here is that I started to get really crabby during those van rides home. And I was just like extremely irritated, kind of anxious. And I, I didn't like it. It wasn't, it wasn't comfortable. And I was, I think probably just telling one of my friends like, dude, these van rides are killing me at the end of the night. It's like, we've just, I've just had my whole day. We just did the show and I've got to get in a van and sit here for like, you know, maybe two hours, because there was a lot of construction going on. In New York City, there's always fucking construction going on, a lot of times late at night. So anyways, I remember this friend of mine, I was like, oh, hey man, just hit my pen. And he gave me this little small vape pen, and I took a hit. I was like, well, whatever. I came back and I put my headphones in, and sat in the van, and started listening to Stephen Sondheim's Merrily We Roll Along. <laughs> which I was, a, I was really a big fan of that show at the time. <clears throat> and yeah, something about the hit off the pen, being with the music, sitting in the van, looking out the window, watching Long Island and you know the New York City and the boroughs go by me on the highway. I felt like I was in euphoria. I just felt like, wow, there's nothing better than this moment which is such a stark contrast from how I was feeling all the previous nights before. And that uh, almost immediately created a habit for me where every single night I'd mosey on over to my friend, he'd let me hit the pen, I'd get in the van, I'd put my headphones on, start that overture. Da, 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 da. I remember one night even a girl said to me like, why do you listen to Merrily Roll Along every single night on the van ride home? She must have been able to hear um, that she must have been able to hear from out, out of my headphones. So, so thinking back, that was honestly like one of the most like hallmark moments, if you will, of why 
and when I started using marijuana because it shifted my internal feeling state from you know, one of negative emotion to one of positive emotion. Even though circumstances were exactly the same, I was still in the van, I was still listening to the music, I was still with those people, but I felt that it shifted my state from a negative orientation to a positive orientation. Now, anybody who smokes weed knows that it's not like that all the time. And the Halloween memory that I got was um, connected to this because I remember one night, like, hitting the pen, and I think they had a lot of candy backstage because it was Halloween, and so I'd, like, I scooped a bunch of candy, and, you know, the munchies kick in, and I was just on the van just eating all of this candy. But I remember also having a pretty intense paranoia that was like, oh my God, everybody on this van knows that I'm eating this candy. <laughs> they're like, and they're, and they're judging me and they're thinking, I can't believe he's eating all that candy. Oh my God, he's going to finish it all. So this is, I mean, look, you guys, I'm doing this video unscripted. So I'm probably going to veer off and take tangents here and there. And, uh, that's partly my aim. First of all, it's extremely vulnerable for me to do a video unscripted. Second of all, much of the way that I would have done videos like this in the past would have been to sit here and basically smoke a joint while I talk to the camera. And if you scroll through my phone photo album, you'll see videos upon videos that last anywhere from 40 to 60 to 20 to, to 60 plus minutes of me just talking, you know, like, cause I, I, I do like to do this, but the point that I'm trying to make is that I felt like I couldn't really ever do it without cannabis. And maybe that falls under the category of one of those later questions I was saying is why did I feel like I should stop? It's because I felt like I couldn't really access this storyteller in me without engaging with the medicine first. And it's all good to use medicine, but I definitely fell into a pattern of overuse, what to speak of abuse, with my cannabis habit. So going back to my paranoid self, sitting in the van, eating the candy, worried that everybody else in the van was judging me because I was eating that candy, this to me upon so much more reflection and experience with the drug is an indication of how cannabis really exposes us to our own inner world, our own inner voices, our own inner critique, um, our shadows, if you will. And so one of the ways I like to describe it is that when I would smoke weed, it would be like the floodgates opened between my own internal consciousness and then the canvas of what is in the exterior space. And it would just like flood outward. The inner would flood outward onto the canvas of the exterior. Oftentimes that canvas of the exterior didn't feel like it was appropriate to contain all that was within. And so this is kind of getting to the nature of shadow work a little bit. Three, two, one, shadow work. None of those people in the van were actually judging me for eating the candy that night or finishing every single last piece or hearing the, the wrappers crinkling. And then I put one piece into the mouth and I was enjoying the candy so much. And at the same time, there was this shame that was all coming from within me. And I was projecting it outward. The story was that they were all noticing me. And because of the, the cannabis, that was heightened. There was this, and I, I can't get into all of the you know, biochemical reasons as to why that happens on a physiological level, but if we look at this more psychologically, more metaphysically, I really think that that is largely what happens. And we're not also stuck in that narrative. It might feel like we are, but people can use, and yeah, we can use these opportunities to actually start to evolve the narrative but a lot of us fall short of seeing that that's even an option. And so we just stay stuck in the narrative. And so at the time, I wasn't thinking of any of this. That was just kind of like, you know, doing my thing. So 
from that point forward, I didn't smoke weed a ton, but I was always really grateful if I was around a friend who offered me some. And that be, kind of became my M.O., right? My M.O. was that I'll smoke if this stuff is offered me. But it's not a problem for me because I never buy it myself. And then that narrative only subsisted for a certain amount of time. And it was probably actually a few years before I then started like buying my own little vape cartridges and vape pen. And then I would, you know, I'd start to hit the pen after work. Oh, it's not a problem. I only smoke at night after work. And then that was the narrative that subsisted for a while. And my point with this is that I went through so many incarnations of that. I don't smoke during the day until I did smoke during the day. And I was like, well, I don't smoke early in the morning until I did start smoking early in the morning. And then I was like, well, I don't smoke before work until I did start smoking before work. And so the ways in which I qualified the my, my, my use were always kind of ways to like make it okay. And again, I was a pretty stressed person. I think that my nervous system was out of whack, hyper activated, if you will. I was always a little bit like too stressed. And so the weed became a vehicle for me to de-stress now, there's nothing wrong with de-stressing, but if the only key that will open that door that I can pass through from stress to de-stress is weed, then we have basically some sort of habit-forming or dependency-forming behavior. And I started to look into, well, why? Why is weed actually making me feel this way? It wasn't the same as just like having a drink, which would take the edge off, but then, you know, the drinking got a little bit more chaotic, and like you feel like you're kind of like less in control, and there's a massive hangover the next day. In the beginning, I really liked cannabis because I didn't feel the hangover the next day, which I would later come to learn that cannabis actually has its own hangover that it comes with. It's a different hangover than uh, a drinking hangover, but you still don't get the the quality deep REM sleep that you need when you have THC in your system. And that became increasingly evident to me over time that when I would smoke before bed, I would wake up in the morning just feeling like I didn't really get good sleep. Having these like massive bags under my eyes, which you know, still persist there today. These last 30 days of weed hasn't just made all that disappear. And I'll get into all, you know, what the last 30 days of, of has been like. But just to circle this back to kind of my, the gradual progression of how cannabis was showing up in my life. And the ways in which I tried to make it okay, and maybe it was okay, but it stayed at that point. I personally have a pretty addictive personality. So I could see how it just started creeping in a little bit more, a little bit more, and a little bit more over time. And then really when the pandemic came, that so completely shifted the structure of my day to day that I wasn't so worried about the rules of like, well, I don't smoke before work, but there was no work. And so, yeah, I think about a year into the pandemic, I just found myself that I was getting high all the time. And it, it still did create that sense of relief. Oh, I know what I was gonna talk about was, um, well, why does cannabis do that? Well, I started looking into it and learning a little bit more about the endocannabinoid system and these you know, CB1, CB2 receptors that we have within us, endogenous cannabinoids that we create within ourselves, which are you know, mimicked to some degree or, or other in the CBD, in the THC that is in our weed. But I was so fascinated at first to learn like, wow, we have an endocannabinoid system built right in with us that is there to help us regulate. It actually is there to help us um, feel connected and feel relaxed and feel rejuvenated and to rest. And so it's, I, I don't think actually the two have to be 
mutually exclusive, that we only get endocannabinoid system with cannabis. Like there, I found out there's so many ways to get the endocannabinoid system going. Exercise, social interaction, singing, breathing. But, you know, weed is a pretty immediate, um, I guess the uptake is extremely quick. The, the way in which it, you know, comes into our blood and our brain is like the very, very fast process, especially if it's being smoked. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like, well, why would I, why would I, you know, walk from Washington Heights to Times Square if I could get on the express train, if you will, <laughs> you know, so what, what's the fastest vehicle that's going to get me to my desired uh, location, my desired outcome. And then that for me, it just became, became weed. I used it to unlock what I felt was a zone of genius within me, a creative side. I started using it before uh, teaching my yoga classes and found that I would just expound, you know, beautiful philosophy and I would found, find nuggets of wisdom that existed inside me that I would have been too shy or too vulnerable or too scared to have shared with other people had I not been under the influence of cannabis. Cannabis somehow took off this filter for me that I felt like I was using to censor myself and instead I just spoke freely. I would even, I mean, friends would be surprised a lot of times when I was around them and if we'd smoke, that all of a sudden even my humor would become more savage. I might start to, you know, insult people in kind of a, like a roasting kind of way where I'm like, and, and they look to me like, oh, Patrick, what, you're this nice, kind of quiet, polite guy, where is this coming from? And this comes a little bit back to that, like, okay, the veil is lifted something is passing through that was contained within that wasn't always finding this outward space, this outward flow. And yeah, what a utility there is in that. But as with any drug, you have to look at, are the benefits greater than the consequences? And for me, over time, it started to become abundantly clear that the, the outcome, the net outcome, was negative for me with weed. It wasn't positive. And another, you know, very popular framework uh, in coaching and personal development and growth is like the idea of um, short-term gratification versus delayed satisfaction. And that was totally like right on the money for me. We did deliver this short-term immediate instant gratification and <clears throat> it didn't so much promote that idea of delayed satisfaction so i'm trying to recount for so many years i mean i'm thinking back to this like even that story i told about my friends that was when i was doing a show in 2018 <laughs> and i remember that show actually there were a lot of stoners so every single night we'd all come back house would be filled up with you know marijuana smoke <laughs> um but anyways i digress i think that the fact that i was using cannabis as frequently as i was when i moved into my current apartment also plays a really big role in why i've struggled to give it up in this apartment so it was this was now maybe I moved here three years ago, so maybe two and a half years ago, I took my first 30-day tolerance break from cannabis because I would occasionally say, I'm, I'm not going to smoke today, and I wouldn't smoke, and I'd feel like, oh, wow, I'm like actually more clear-headed now than I was in the past. This is kind of nice. Um, but, you know, as with the story of many people who struggle with addiction, you say you're going to give something up, but when the rubber meets the road, you don't give that thing up. And then all of a sudden now you're in a conflict with, with yourself. You're sort of like, well, I said I was going to do this. And then my actions didn't mirror my intentions. What happened? And when there is a substance at the center of that thing, it, I think oftentimes does mean that there's some sort of addiction that's happening there. 
So I was starting to get clued into like, wow, I might be addicted to this stuff. And I decided to take a 30 day break. It was the month of May in, I want to say probably 2022. And I know this because I was hosting a three day retreat in New York City, a live in-person event where I was inviting some of my coaching clients and my friends to come out where you're gonna do three days of just like workshop style, you know, get clear in your values, get clear in your vision, get clear in your strategy for who you're becoming next. I was gonna implement all the stuff that I've been working on with Kate Stillman, with my coaching business, with my yoga business, and at this, at this in-person event. And I did this 30-day break leading right up to the event. And I remember saying to my therapist, like, okay, yeah, I'm feeling really good. It's already day 22. I can't believe it. I'm not even thinking about weed anymore. But I think I'm going to need to smoke right before I go into the event. Not like, not like right before, like literally. <laughs> Just pause there. What I meant was I wanted to sit down and have this like kind of meditation with cannabis so that I could get inspiration for what I was going to do over the course of that week. And I remember Michelle, my therapist, sort of saying like, what would happen if you didn't? Anyways, I get to day 30, I do smoke again, I get the download, I, I do my brainstorm, I, I decide what I'm gonna do over the weekend because I'm a total procrastinator. Like I planned this weekend, I invited people, I enrolled people, I had people coming, but I still kinda had no idea what we were actually gonna do. And I'm someone who really waits till the last minute and I think that, again, I was using that cannabis almost less to do the brainstorm that I needed to do and more so to alleviate the amount of stress that I was feeling over the expectations that I had for myself for what that weekend was supposed to be. We've got a train going in the background, so just uh, forgive the, uh, the choo-choo sound. Um, so here's the thing. Once I took that 30 day break and then I re-engaged with cannabis to do the brainstorm, that basically broke the paradigm of like, well, I'm not smoking right now to I am smoking right now. And sure enough, the morning of the retreat, before I went and met all my members, I was feeling so anxious that I thought, oh, I'll just take a little hit off my pipe. And I did, and it did make me feel better. And I walked out, and I walked up from, you know, the apartment I was staying at to in Washington Heights up to Bennett Park and met them all, and we, we started the retreat. And you know what? I actually ended up using weed throughout the course of that entire weekend, before sessions, in between sessions. And it just, you can hear that there's like a downward tone in my voice as I say that, almost as though I'm disappointed. And this is not me passing any kind of judgment against cannabis. Me using cannabis, people who use cannabis, people who use it effectively, that's great. But I feel like the downward pull in my voice is because of the disappointment that I wasn't able to source from within to do this. I still kind of felt like I needed something outside of myself cannabis to create the experience that I needed to create both for myself and for my members that weekend. And I think that's actually a lie. I think the truth is actually that all of us, we have within us what is necessary for the moment without reaching for externals. And so just looking back on that weekend, in so many instances from that point forward, I saw how much I didn't trust myself enough to just go in alone. And I would actually start to use that framework because famous actress Elaine Stritch, in her documentary, you'll hear her talking about how she was a, an alcoholic. And she is famously quoted in saying, I don't go out there alone. It's too scary to go out there alone. And what she means when she says that is that she doesn't go out on stage unless she has a drink or two or three in her because it's too scary to go out there alone. And for the next couple of years, I actually abided by that same philosophy. I was like, you know what? I, I, I don't want to do 
life alone. I feel more comfortable when I have this drug in me. It was like a friend. It was like a something that, that empowered me, something that encouraged me. But going back to something I said earlier, there are always trade-offs. Not everything is just going to be um, so linear that it gets us exactly to where we want to be. There's some give and take that comes with it. And again, I found that with cannabis, especially smoking it, my voice took a big hit. My, my throat, like, it started to become hard for me to speak. It was more labored for me to sing. My voice was scratchier. It was more, like, gravelly in a way. So, yeah, like, that was the, the first time I did a 30-day break. And then I would just come back and I would, I would you know, oscillate back and forth between smoking and then feeling bad about myself that I was smoking and then stopping for a couple days and then starting again and I really just um yeah there was certain things I became unwilling to do without having cannabis teaching yoga was a big one for me it wasn't that I couldn't it was just much more that I so preferred who I was and what the experience was like if I was a little bit stoned. So I did take other 30 day tolerance breaks. I twist it. But the thing is, is they would particularly happen when I traveled because then I wouldn't have the cannabis available to me. And don't think that I wouldn't try to find it when I was traveling. If you look at my Google search history, if I'm in any of these given places, is weed legal in Thailand? Which I found out it was, had been legalized a few months earlier, and then later that day was at a dispensary. So it's kind of getting into the thing of like, are you in control of the thing or is the thing in control of you? And it just so clearly to me got to the point where like, it was in control of me. You know, and there were times where, yeah, it made me a lot more enjoyable to be around. I felt like I had a much easier time connecting with people, especially very meaningful people in my life who sometimes I had a hard time connecting with. I'd smoke a little bit of weed, I'd open up, and then I would connect with them. And I'd be like, oh, this is, this is good. But really, over time, I feel like the compound effect was actually net negative. I, I, and then, I mean, I haven't even really gotten yet to how bad things got because I was smoking. And just a few of the things, I don't even know how long I've been talking yet, but I don't want this to go for too long. Um, I lost track of really caring at all about my finances. And that wasn't because I was spending a lot of money on weed. I, w I wasn't. I would go down and get like a pre-roll at the gas station, you know, like from the, the guy who kept them in a little bag behind the counter. <laughs> it wasn't like I was spending a lot on weed itself, but being stoned made me not care about how I was spending my money. And so I would, I would spend incredible amounts of money on, on coaching, on even just my whole move up here, I spent a lot of money. And it, I don't think those were bad purchases necessarily. I think they did come from places of integrity. But I wasn't factoring in some of the the more, what do you, what do you say, like the practical ways of like budgeting for things. All of that was lost on me. I did not care about keeping my house clean when I was stoned. I did not care about what I was eating when I was stoned. I would like, the eating got completely out of control. I would just eat everything in sight. I would, I would get the munchies so bad that I would finish off full, you know, bags of chips, uh, containers of cookies, didn't matter what it was. If it was there, I would eat it. And it put me on what I over time started to identify as the dopamine train. <laughs> I, it put me on what I started to identify over time as the dopamine train where smoking the weed, it released that initial like um, rush of dopamine, but dopamine is a chemical that just makes us ultimately want more. So then I was like, well, where can I get my next hit of dopamine now that I've already smoked some weed? 
oh, maybe I can eat something. Maybe I can watch some porn. Maybe I can jerk off. Maybe I can, you know, it just would go on and on and on and on. And so we're now into kind of the, where it was bad, where weed was not helping me. My energy levels were shot. I was so lethargic. I had a hard time like pulling myself out of bed, walking up the stairs. I had no desire to go to the gym and work out, even though now at the time I'm working at a gym. So honestly, like even sitting here and trying to recapitulate the last couple of years of my life is hard because I was stoned for so many of those days. It was so cloudy. Now I'm someone who has a pretty good memory. And I think that maybe, maybe my memory was too good. And so weed would help me get a little bit more into the present moment. But then I, I wouldn't, I don't remember things the way I would have remembered them if I was sober. I'm sitting here thinking like, wow, there was a whole, you know, six months where I was babysitting Penelope. A lot of times when I was watching Penelope, I would have a little gummy or sneak out and take a little hit while she was taking a nap. These are not things that I particularly feel good about. It's um, part of the reason why I'm here today after several attempts of doing 30 days and here I am doing 30 days. And honestly, I, I really don't feel like super qualified to be sharing a video of what I've realized after 30 days because really my takeaway is that 30 days is nothing. Like this is actually only just the beginning of me coming back into a relationship where myself, where I trust myself and I know myself without, again, any of the external, like without using cannabis as that vehicle. Yeah, it did help me, you know, lift that floodgate. It did put me in situations where, you know, when that inner version of me was coming out in a way that felt incongruent with the external environment, it showed me that that was just even more of my own story about what was going on. <laughs> So yes, it helped me so much, but we can learn from things without having to continually imbibe them again and again and again. I saw Teal Swan say this in some video, like you can learn from cannabis without smoking cannabis. And then she went on to say, well, you're learning from me and you're not smoking me, are you? <laughs> but my, my main point here is I actually, after these 30 days, it was not easy. You know, there were so many days where I was just like resigned to the couch, resigned to my bed, just like laying down, can't do anything. But over time, I started to feel clear headed again. I started to feel like I was getting ideas for projects that I would want to work on. I did not want to work on any projects, you know, in the past. Or I would only want to work on them if I was stoned. And there's a whole other video I could do on how much um, smoking weed played into my coaching business and how many coaching calls I felt like I had to get high for before leading. The sales calls I had to get high for before leading. It was like just so extra. But the reason I'm making this video today is because it is my hope and my intention that 30 days from now, I can be sitting down and making another video that is telling you about what my experience has been like after 60 days without weed. Because I've done 30 days in the past. I haven't done 60 days in over four years. So I want to shout out uh, Dr. Frank of Addiction Mindset. I've been watching his content for years, finally jumped into his school community to participate in the Silver October Challenge. And that is why I did this Silver October. It's because someone invited me into a container where we were all observing sobriety from our choice of substance. And for me, that's weed. And um, I don't know what's gonna be in the future. I don't know if I'm like someone who's gonna, you know, never do it again. Moderation sounds great. Can I moderate? I don't know. But I know for today, I really am curious about who I will become if I continue this, this abstinence. Sobriety is not for everybody, but as one of my good friends said, sobriety is a flex. And I'm all, I'm all about, you know, being strong. I was going to say I'm all about flexing, but...
<laughs> that sounds so dumb. No, I'm all about like building strength. It is a huge part of my, you know, me working out in the gym, me working at a gym, me being a yoga teacher, having a yoga practice. It feels good to be strong. And we get a strength from sobriety and we need a strength for sobriety. All right, you guys, thanks for listening.